The last chapter is on fluids, fluid mechanics, fluids at rest, fluids in motion. And now we're going to look at heat. Um, let me pause and give you a little, a little plug for engineering here. So one of the main fields in engineering is thermal management. And it, usually it's like thermal fluid systems that you work with. Um, for example, like an HVAC system in a building, all the ventilation, all the heating, anything with this fluid flow involved. So in college, if you want to study engineering and you're considering it, you want to think about the fact that you can study mechanical engineering, but then within mechanical engineering, all these different topics we've covered in physics have like their own concentration. So thermal fluid management or thermal fluid systems is one area you can work in. You can work in control systems. Do you remember with the, um, with the oscillating mass system, with the spring, and the, the idea that the mass would go up and down with harmonic motion, but eventually it would die out? You can control that motion with like a thing called a damper, that's another type of engineering. Um, and we went, to, went through a lot of different things with this this year. Even with projectile motion, you can study mainly dynamics. Uh, but this in itself is the second part. So the first part was fluids. That was the last chapter we worked on, chapter 12. And this is the second part to this concentration, if you wanted to consider that. Um, if you, like, I have a friend who does this actually for a living now. And he works, it's really cool actually. He works for this company in Pennsylvania who make the shields on rockets when they re-enter through the atmosphere so that the rocket doesn't burn up and the, a the astronaut, him or herself, doesn't you know, get fried on the way in. So they actually design the shields and they work with thermal management. The whole idea of radiation as you're coming in, the actual amount of heat that is developed simply from going at a high velocity. The amount of drag that's there creates friction, which also creates heat. So the idea here, if you want to consider this for like an engineering degree, it's something that I think is very interesting. I took a lot of courses in this area. We're going to kind of just touch the surface again now with the, with the heat stuff. We're going to go further than probably what you did in chem. Um, but some of the stuff might be a little review, like MC delta T, does that ring a bell? Okay, that's also something from physics we're going to talk about with, uh, with thermal energy and phase changes. Okay, so first, talking about temperature. Temperature is something that we use to measure how much energy something really has, specifically how much kinetic energy. So if we're thinking about, um, there's a Bill Nye video where he takes a frozen sculpture, I could play it, but I'll, I can demonstrate and tell you what it is much easier. Take a frozen sculpture and then he takes a match and he says to you, which of these has more energy? And most people right away think the match because it's hot, heat, energy, average kinetic energy, the same idea. But because the frozen sculpture has so much mass, it actually has more energy itself. And the way you can tell is he then takes the match and holds it up to the, like this big frozen sculpture. And eventually what happens to the match? Yeah, it dies out. It's not going to obviously melt an entire ice sculpture, right? So he's trying to emphasize the fact that there's not enough heat in the match, not enough energy to cause this to change its phase before it dies out. So there's actually more energy in the ice sculpture than there is in the match. But the average kinetic energy of the particles, here's the difference. The actual kinetic energy that each particle has on average is higher in the match than in the ice sculpture. Because there's so much mass in the ice, ice sculpture, all those little bits of energy added together is more than the match. So imagine here, the match hypothetically, right, has seven particles. I'm giving an arbitrary makeup, made up number. This is not real, okay? So there's seven particles to the match. Each of those particles though has a lot of energy. Let's say each of those particles has an energy level of 10 joules. That's a total of 70 joules of energy that a match would have. But then you put it up to an ice sculpture. The ice sculpture has, instead of seven particles, the ice sculpture has like a billion particles compared to a match or the flame that's in a match. So we're talking one billion particles here, which I'm not obviously going to draw. Each of those particles has an energy level that's like very, very small, like 0.05 joules. Okay, much smaller on average, right? Comparing these numbers here. The energy in a match, 10 joules, or each particle in a match, versus the energy in each particle in an ice sculpture are much lower. But because there's a billion of these particles, which has more overall energy would be the ice sculpture. Take a billion times 0.05, what are we going to get? What is that, 50 million? We'll move two spots, I guess? Something like 50 million or 5 million? Something absurdly large compared to what we're talking about when it comes to 70 joules. And we're looking at like 50 million joules still because there's a billion of these particles. So I want you to understand that temperature is not how much energy something actually has, 
but the average energy of each particle. Each of these particles, look back over here at the match. This is a match being held with the flame. Each of these seven particles has a lot of energy. But overall, not much energy because it's not many particles. But if you have a lot more mass, you have a lot more energy. And this also comes into play, and this is not something we're going to get to in this course, but you've all seen this equation before somewhere. E equals mc squared. That idea is the fact that energy and mass can be kind of interrelated or intertwined. If you have more mass, you have more energy. And we know that also from kinetic energy. What's the formula for kinetic energy? What's the formula for kinetic energy or potential energy? Either one. What have mv squared and potential energy? MGY. What do they both have? Mass. Okay, so the idea here I want to get at is that temperature is a measurement of the average energy of each particle. So a higher temperature here is because each particle has more energy. A lower temperature, each of these many particles has much less energy. Um, all right. So you can add or remove energy from two things, and we know this. If we add energy, what are we doing really? We're just increasing the actual temperature. So if you hold, if you hold a lighter underneath, uh, or like a barbecue lighter underneath, uh, Anybody, anybody ever use the chimney stacks for coal? Anybody ever do a barbecue with coal before? You use lighter fluid? Okay, you use, lighter fluid works too, but if you use a chimney stack, you can hold a lighter, it's like a little metal can, and you put charcoal in it, and you put a little piece of newspaper on the bottom. You light it, and it slowly burns, which causes the coals to heat up, and then cause heat via conduction, and move up little by little. So that's what you'd be doing here. You're adding only a little bit of energy to the bottom there, right? Now that energy in turn though heats up the coals. What do coals have in them? <coughs> what, what, what would you call that? They're ready to give off heat because they have a lot of inside you. What's the word in, in physics you would use or in, even in chemistry? What kind of energy is it when it's inside you? Stored. Stored, that's a good word. What's another word? Potential, Potential another word, good. One more I'm thinking of. And it's used specifically for objects. You would call it internal energy. The internal energy and in you spit. Think about like, the energy that's released when there's some sort of a chemical reaction that occurs, something happens to change the chemical makeup of the element, right? As a result, energy is either released or gained. In this case, the energy is released in the form of heat. The coals are chemically reacting, and the energy comes off from there. So as a result, the energy that's stored inside the coals is released to the environment above it, causing everything to heat up. So that's what we're talking about here. As you add energy, you're literally, where is that energy coming from? You can't create energy, right? We talked about that. Conservation of energy says that energy has to come from somewhere. Where does the heat come from in a barbecue? The coals have internal energy that's being changed into heat or thermal energy, Q. That's where Q equals MC delta T is going to come into play. I'm not sure. Um, so it's a relative term. What do I mean by this? Why do I have these two pictures on the board here? Say temperature is a relative term, and then I put a picture of ice cold water and then hot chocolate next to it. It's a relative term. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to show that, like, in the cold, Okay, that's possibly part of it, but I'm thinking about relative as in, like, comparatively. Comparing the two, relative. I should have given more detail for relative there. So, comparing the two. Yeah, um, you can use it in both cases. But you can, it can be seen in both cases. It can be seen in both cases. It's like, um, the hot chocolate is going to be hot in comparison to, like, Yeah, it's relative to each other. So like if I touch hot chocolate, it feels hot. And then if I touch cold water, it feels even colder than it actually is because my hand was just on something hot, right? Now, think about this. If I touch the hot chocolate versus scalding hot boiling water where steam's coming off, that's even hotter. It's all relative in that sense. So human bodies are at what temperature? What temperature should you be at when you get your temperature taken? What's a healthy temperature? Yeah, 98.6 I think is the temperature you want to be, but somewhere in the 98s. So why does cold water feel cold? Because we are hotter than cold water is. What's cold water temperature approximately in Fahrenheit? Freezing is 32 in Fahrenheit. In Celsius it's zero, but we use Fahrenheit a lot, right? So freezing is 32, what do you think cold water would be then? Maybe like 40, 50, something like that. Maybe 60 might be too hot. Room temperature is 70. So let's say 40. 40 compared to 90, right? That's the thing. Now, hot boiling water, what's the temperature? 
Yeah, when it's actually the boiling point is 212 Fahrenheit. So when the water comes right off the stove, it could be up at like 200 degrees at least. That's why if you touch that water right away, what'll happen? And you'll burn yourself, you'll scold yourself from that. So it's all relative to the human body. If we were aliens on another planet, hot and cold might be different things. See what I'm saying? It's all relative, it's heat transfer, right? It's what's gonna lead us into, yeah. Is that one when you're in a hot tub and then you get out of the hot tub and jump into the pool, it's a lot cooler? Yeah, that's exactly. Or if you've ever done this, ever been to the beach and it's getting late, it's actually warmer in the water sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Ever been that, where you're like in the water, you're like, you get out of the water and you feel that breeze, you're like, oh, I wanna get back in the water. It's all relative. So during the, wa the water earlier, it was cold because it was hotter after the sun was out. Now the sun's gone, it feels warmer in the water. And it's all relative. So we need to understand what relative means, right? When you're comparing two things. All right, now thermal equilibrium, this is the idea that two things are in a state of temperature equilibrium instead of force equilibrium. So temperature equilibrium simply means that they have the same contact temperature. Take your hand, everybody, touch your desk. It feels a little bit. Why? Our body. Body's 98. What's room temperature? What do you say around? around? We should know these numbers, guys. Around 70 is room temperature. If you didn't know that, jot that one down, especially if you use Celsius in the past. So I think Celsius is like 20-something, 20 22, 23. Um, so around 70 degrees, your body's 98. So is your hand in the desk in thermal equilibrium? If you hold it there long enough though, what do you notice? Yeah, ever look at the desk, you start to see like a little bit of like, almost like, uh, it looks like fog. It looks like fog, condensation around your hand. That has to do with the energy. The actual energy is increasing, so it's gathering that, those air molecules that can condense actually. Is that what like you press your hand far enough? You see the imprint that's left, yeah. And if you hold it there for a while, and then, and you've done this before, how many of you ever sat down in a seat and you wonder, what do you wonder when you sit in that seat when it's nice and warm? What did somebody just do? Wow, you've never done that when you sit in a seat when it's warm? You probably think, did someone just fart in the seat? There's not a, you've never thought that before? I've thought that one before, oh my gosh. You sit in a seat and it's like overly warm, you're like somebody just got up. They didn't obviously fart in the seat or anything. The body temperature of the person elevates it to almost like 90 something degrees when you're sitting there. But this plastic is made so that it's not gonna melt at 98 degrees or else you're gonna be sitting in it and start melting, right? Okay, because eventually that chair will probably get close to your body temperature because of the fact that it heats it up. You're wearing, you're wearing clothes, so obviously they act as thermal barriers or insulation. So all of your heat, or your heat is not gonna transfer out of your body. Um, how about windows? How does uh, it like clothes and like control <laughs> like, you know, like those shirts that are like thirty-two heat? I don't know if you know that. And they're like, oh, like the uni clothes. Um, different types of fabric and stuff. You mean? Yeah. yeah. In the past ten years, it has because of uh, advancements in like nanotechnology, really, fibers. Um, before, I want to say like ten years ago. You were always getting like cotton. Spandex was barely coming out and that was like where Under Armour started. Then Under Armour started using insulation and they made cold gear, which was like a thicker spandex. But now there's like, I mean, every type of shirt. There's ones that wick heat, or wick sweat off. There's ones that keep you warm. So yeah, there, there's pretty much anything now with thermal insulation barriers. But it, it's, a, it's a function of material science. So materials engineering, if you're interested in that, that's another type of engineering. Material science specifically is all about that kind of stuff where you're looking at the chemical makeup, the composition. You're really, to be honest, like you're, if you get a PhD or a, or a master's in chemistry, it's the equivalent of getting like a master's in material science and engineering. It's really the same thing. One of my friends went to Northwestern. He was a valedictorian in high school. Really good friend of mine, actually. Um, smart guy, real smart. He, he transferred from another school, actually, when we were in high school. And he's, uh, he, he had his master's and PhD in chemistry, and now he works for IBM in their labs developing new materials for their like microprocessors and all their different um, electronics and controls that have different properties. So if you want a material that's a combination of like silicon and all these other metals, so that it exhibits properties of like very low temperature resistivity, but it allows electricity to flow very easily through it. Um, maybe it also can store energy as a capacitor based on the material. He's developing materials and polymers to do this kind of stuff. But anyway, it's a side note for like chemistry and engineering too. Um, so thermal equilibrium, the idea, guys, is that the two things in contact need to be at the same temperature. If they're not, if they're not, what you'll notice is that the heat from one body flows to the other body. And 
what makes sense if you think about potential energy? Just, this is completely analogous to potential energy. If I have the object here, it's got a good amount of potential. If I drop it, it lands on the ground. When it's on the ground, how much potential energy does it have? Zero. Zero, right? So we're saying that it has high potential and then it goes to low potential. Which has more energy, my hand or the desk, based on what we're thinking about now? My hand. So where's the heat flow from? High potential to low. High energy to lower energy. So that's how you remember how heat flows. It always goes from hot to cold, relatively speaking. Right? It's all relative. Any hotter material transfers its energy into a colder material. Um, this idea is really, I just go over because of applications. I don't know, I don't think you did this in chemistry <coughs> last year. Did you do any math with thermal expansion? Thermal expansion is the concept that as temperature increases, the volume of something generally, there are exceptions, but water is one of them, increases. Okay, as temperature increases, the volume generally increases. Water has an exception. When you freeze water, it actually expands, which is opposite of most things. When you freeze them or you make them a solid, they contract. So this idea here, the example you can see right away is how a thermometer works. If you've ever seen an old mercury thermometer, now what are we using them? Is it iodine now? What's it's the red? Hydrogen is Yeah? Hydrogen is gas at room temperature. No, it's hydrogen liquid or something. Okay. Some, I don't know. So, but it has a high thermal exp expansion coefficient. So it's able to expand. Yeah, look it up for us. Uh, thermal expansion coefficient is the value that rates how easily something can expand based on an increase in temperature. So for example, there are things called thermocouples. They have a little metal on each side of them. Here's what it looks like. There's a metal strip here with another metal strip over here. At certain temperatures, they're different materials. At certain temperatures, one of these strips might start to increase or decrease in its size. And as a result, this needle, you call it a needle, starts to bend. The rate at which it bends can be, with an algorithm, translated into a temperature. So if there's more heat added, it might bend more in one direction. If there's heat removed, if it gets colder, it'll bend in the other direction. So this fluctuates from side to side. This would be like a fixed part right here. Now on the back here, you would have all these different temperatures. So the needle itself literally bends. You've seen this before with an analog thermometer. How many of you have ever used a thermometer to measure the temperature of meat when you're cooking outside? On the back, doesn't it have a little thing that's an analog scale? It's not usually, some of you may have digital ones, they're fancy, right, I'm sure. But if you get the regular ones, they have the little analog scale, it's a little, little meter like this. This is two pieces of metal, and when the temperature changes, it bends in one direction or the other because the thermal expansion coefficient on each piece of metal is different. They are specifically made, and they're calibrated. What does calibration mean? Calibrated. Calibrated. You know what this is. Come on, some of you used this word before. Isn't it like when you try to like, restart something, or like, for example, like, I know it's like a scale, you have to like calibrate it back to the zero? Yeah. If you're using any sort of a scale whatsoever, you always have to calibrate it to zero. So when you're using the triple beam bounds, when you're using the scale next door in chemistry, you hit the button on there that said either zero or calibrate. It made it reset, right? So this tool is calibrated in a way such that this will bend perfectly to indicate the correct temperature. Isn't that amazing to think about? Like the exact correct amount of each material at the right composition with the right imperfections to it allows this to bend one way or the other based on temperature alone. That's how analog scales will work. So thermal expansion, that's one example. There are many others. I was driving in the winter time. I'm driving and all of a sudden, what do I see? Tire pressure is low. Why is tire pressure low in the winter time? You know this from gas laws last year. Because if you fill it up during the summer, since it's hotter out, the gas is expanding. And then in the winter? It, it contracts. In the winter, gas contracts because of the fact that it's a lower temperature. How do you prevent that? Anybody know? Who knows their cars? How do you prevent, I don't even know cars well, but I know this random facts. So I thought someone knew cars well. How do you prevent tires from, in the winter time, besides refilling them, obviously? There's a new method. What are you filling with now? Anyone know? It's no longer like regular air, actually. A lot of gas stations, a lot of mechanics specifically use nitrogen now. Nitrogen does not contract as much as regular, whatever is in regular air that they put out, I guess it's oxygen. It doesn't contract as much at all. So in the winter time, you do not get like, I mean, you go from like 31 PSI to maybe 30.5. I was at 22 PSI the other day driving. 
And my little monitor came up and I'm like, are you kidding me? And I couldn't believe it. I'm trying to figure out, I was borrowing my dad's car. And he doesn't like think in the winter time to top it off with air. I went, every tire was at like 27. When it's below 25, the other monitor comes on. Yeah. Isn't that kind of like the Patriots and the football? Yeah, it's very much like that. That was like, that was, uh, I'm not gonna get into the politics there because I know I have Patriot fans in the room that I'm a Jets fan. But that was, in the beginning, do you remember all the memes of Belichick? And they're like, you yeah. know, now I'm a science professor also because he did quote some stuff they had no idea about. <laughs> I have no idea about the ending. I didn't even actually look at the ending, so I'm not going to get into it. Thermal expansion, other examples that are good. Um, in the summertime, the wooden doors, what happens to them when you go to close a wooden door? They swell up. Humidity and heat both cause it to swell. Uh, on the bridge, you've done this before. If you've driven over the bridge, if you've ever looked down, you see, what do you see in the bridge every like maybe 100 feet? You see these things. I'm going like this with my fingers. Yeah, they're a little like. Yeah. Iron bars and like locking mechanisms they look like. You've seen this before on a bridge? It's not a drawbridge, guys. These, these, there's no drawbridges around here. So what is it? What does it allow for? It's like in the winter delays and the summer Yeah, in the winter time, the metal itself contracts. So it needs to kind of move a little bit like this. And then in the summertime, it allows for things to expand. And we're specifically talking about the concrete and the material itself and the metal that it's made up of. So the expansion and contraction is where there's a little bit of a give there. It's like, uh, it's not the same thing, but when you get on the subway platform and the platform sometimes extends because there's a little gap there. It's like, watch the gap, and you see the platform actually extend. It extends on its own because of thermal expansion in the summertime. So it needs to have that avail availability of a little bit more room. So in the wintertime, you see that little gap there. All right? Okay, in the wintertime, that's when you see that little gap there. There are a lot of other examples, and you can probably think of others yourself, but this is a very important and applicable topic. There's, a, by the way, there's a lot of math in thermal expansion. If we have an extra day in this chapter, maybe we'll go back and do a little bit more math on it, but I did skip it for now. I didn't teach it in the past, but the new text we're using this year has it, so I was tempted to use it, but I didn't jump on it right away. I thought you covered it in chem, but then I asked Mr. J this morning, he said, I don't think we covered thermal expansion, the math part of it last year in chem. He said you guys did stuff with like PV equals NRT, where you have expansion of volume due to Boyle's gas law and the gas laws. Um, this you should kind of know already. These are just your temperature scales. F for Fahrenheit, C for Celsius. Um, why is it more useful to use Celsius? You kind of know this. You learn this in your math and science courses, I hope, at some point. This makes sense because zero degrees over 100 Yeah, it, it uses the baseline of water, pretty much. That's what we know, right? It uses the baseline of water. So zero is our freezing and our melting temperature, and 100 is our condensing or evaporating. You call that vaporization, the, the 100 temperature, and the other one actually is called fusion. You want to jot those phrases down, because they are useful. We're going we're gonna to use them later in this chapter. Okay, so when it melts or freezes, that's called the state of fusion there. It's a phase change of fusion. When it melts or freezes when it either condenses back to a liquid from being a gas, or when it, when it evaporates into a gas from being a liquid, that's evaporation or vaporization. So liquid, or liquid to gas or gas to liquid? Gas to liquid or liquid to gas is called latent heat or heat of vaporization. We're going to use that with phase changes. What was fusion when it already melts? Either when it melts or when it solidifies. Oh, okay. Melts or freezes. For, for, we're, we're using water as our example, right? So yeah. I'll use the word freeze, but I guess anything really does freeze when it goes from a liquid to a solid, you could say. Uh, what do you notice? What do you notice about your coefficients? Anybody know the significance of the nine-fifths? Anybody pick up on that? What do you got? Isn't that what you use to change the Celsius Yeah, that's the, that's the how much bigger one is than the other. So let's think about this for a second, okay? Everybody draw a little scale here. Let's put zero Celsius here and 100 Celsius here. Now, you guys know the next numbers, so I'm going to ask you, what is it in Fahrenheit again? Uh, 212. 212. And freezing in Fahrenheit? 32. That's why somebody referenced 32 below earlier or something like that, right? Freezing temperature, 32 below. Now, which has more degrees that go by in between? Obviously, you can see here from 212 to, th to 32, this is 180, isn't it? Let's jot that down. So delta F is 180 while delta C is only 100. We notice that? 
180 over 100, what does that reduce to? What is it? Nine fifths. Okay, significance of your numbers, so you understand where they come from. Nine fifths, that's where that comes from right there. I mean, you could also just plot a linear function here, right? We're looking at change, delta y over delta x here. So you can plot a function here and just look at these as your coordinates. You could say one coordinate is 100 comma 212. The other coordinate is 0 comma 32. Find the function that relates these two. Well, if you call one of them y and one of them x, you'll get this upper function right here. The slope will be 9 fifths. The y-intercept, if you clearly see, it, is 32. 0 comma 32. That's your y-intercept right there. The slope here, though, will give you 9 fifths. If you don't believe me, guys, if I find the line between these two points, you'll get this first equation up top. Okay? Now, that's the easy part, I think, because you've all seen this before. That's the easy part, because you've seen this before here. Um, what's the other two scales? Before I even go, if you, you can look ahead, but anyone know the other two scales that I'm looking? There's two other scales that we've used before. And they're, they're useful in certain applications. We'll talk about why. Kelvin. Kelvin is one of them. Very good. The other one most people don't know because it really is never used anymore at all. It's called the Rankine. It's the same thing as Kelvin is for the Fahrenheit scale. What is Kelvin really compared to Celsius? What's the whole idea there? Go ahead. That, you, that we only use Celsius because it, it works for us, but Kelvin is actually zero, zero, instead of just the level of the water, the freezing point of water. Yeah, so zero is the freezing point of water, right? In the Celsius scale, zero Celsius. But zero Kelvin is the absence of any heat whatsoever. Nothing can be zero Kelvin. Okay, let's go to the, is on the next slide yet? Yeah. Nothing can be zero Kelvin. Literally, it's negative 273 Celsius. That's how cold it is. It's far colder than frozen, than uh, frozen H2O, or frozen water, ice. It's far colder. Why can't anything ever get to zero Kelvin? Anyone know this? This is a really weird theory to think about. There's two, you can give several answers, but there's one that makes the most sense. If you think about how heat transfer works and how refrigerators work. Think about how refrigerators and freezers work. And think about why nothing can ever be zero Kelvin. It's a little bit of like a calculus idea, actually. It's kind of cool. It, it, it's, it's, yeah, don't, don't, don't put your head down, as I said, it's a calculus idea. It does, it's not like mathematical heavy. Give me your stab at it first, because I think he knows, because he had his hand up right away. So I want to give you a shot first. There's always energy of some kind. That's one of the reasons, absolutely. Is that the reason you were going to say? Yeah, and also that it takes energy to make something colder. Okay, <laughs> that's the second part right there. So th those two parts together, that's exactly right. So Ernest has the right idea. Everything has energy. Remember I said earlier, if you have mass, you have energy. And if you have mass, you have to exist. If you don't exist, does it matter? Obviously you have no energy if you don't exist. Like, does anything around me, like, I shouldn't say that because the air around me is gas, does have some energy. But any piece of matter, any particle has energy. So as a result, every particle has to have some sort of average kinetic energy, some sort of temperature, even if it's a little bit above zero Kelvin. Now, the second answer is the one that's more of a calculus approach. It's called a limit. You've heard of this before. Remember asymptotes? Remember asymptotes in your math class? As something gets closer and closer to the y-axis, but it, like, it ran up against the y-axis, or it got closer to the x-axis and behavior. So this is the same idea. How do you make something colder? How do you make something colder? Physically. Answer? Come on. How would you make something colder? You both come home with a bottle of water, a can of soda, something you want to make it colder. How do you make it colder? Put it in the fridge. Why? Because what's in the fridge? It's colder in the fridge. If something's colder than the other thing, what do you say happens automatically when you touch it? What's happening? Transfer of, Transfer of heat. So the, the can of soda has a lot of heat, even though it's room temperature compared to the fridge, doesn't it? So what happens to all the heat in the soda? It transfers, the it transfers into the fridge. So the fridge has to be colder than the soda for it to work. Would you agree with that? Eventually, they're in a state of thermal equilibrium in this case, equilibrium. Eventually, the can of soda gets down to whatever the fridge temperature is. Now, how can you get zero Kelvin? You need something colder than zero Kelvin, don't you? Think about what we just said, by definition. To get the soda to get colder, don't you have to put it in something colder than it is? So if you're at 0.1 Kelvin, 
Don't you have to put something less than that to get it colder? So to get to zero Kelvin, wouldn't you have to put, something, put it in something that's less than zero Kelvin? But by definition, zero Kelvin's the lowest. So you've hit a bit of like a, a conundrum. You're like, you're, you're, you can't, it's a catch-22. You can't have one without the other. So you want to get something colder than zero Kelvin, but you need to get to zero Kelvin, but you can't get to zero Kelvin because it's a limiting factor. You literally, there's no such thing colder than zero Kelvin to put it in to get it to zero Kelvin. If I want to get to zero Kelvin, there's no way I can ever get that cold unless I'm in something colder. That's the whole idea of a refrigerator, right? So I can't ever get to zero Kelvin no matter what. My. I don't know about that. That's a good question. We, it's possible. I don't know if you've actually done research in this. I'm, I'm trying to think about like physically, material science. Maybe things can, but I don't think it's possible theoretically because the molecules have to be moving. That's the whole idea of any temperature, right? Any kinetic energy. But I don't, I don't know. We can theorize all day long because there's no way to get to that. Now, there have been like tests where they've gotten to fractions of a Kelvin, believe it or not, very close to absolute zero. And properties change a lot. So maybe, yeah, maybe they do and they're not able to withstand something like that. Maybe something changes internally that, it, that also prevents it. Does that, does that change at all about quantum mechanics? So, I, don't, I didn't study much of quantum mechanics. I do know that Mr. Donacek, he was a physics major in college, and I know he took courses in quantum physics. Um, I, I know that at different levels, at different scales, properties change a lot, like a real lot. So that's really what, what I was thinking about there with the idea of temperature changing. Because certain things like superconductors start to exhibit properties that don't exhibit at certain temperature levels. So I, I'm, I have a feeling that yes, it has to do with you know the size also for the temperature effect. Okay, let's put that away. I'm sorry, so, um, so does that mean that in a black hole there's possibly? I don't know. I was thinking about that for a minute. I was like, maybe it's something like that where it, you could have temperatures that low. But if there's mass, which it, there is mass to it because it's very dense, it should have some energy or some sort of temperature to it. I just lost airplay. Go to the next slide, please. We look at the table here in blue <coughs> until I get airplay back. So the Fahrenheit scale we're looking at, we see meteorology, which means the weather, right? Every day we speak in terms of Fahrenheit in the U.S. for the weather. For in the U.S., this is talking about. Um, for medicine and then non-scientific uses in the U.S. I know, I lost airplay. I know, I, I said that already. Um, and then Celsius, we're looking at back, come on. Uh, majorly the same exact things, but outside of the U.S., the same categories. But for Kelvin specifically, if you recall from last year in chemistry, when you looked at um, Boyle's gas law and what else was it? With, well, I'm trying to think of your gas laws. There were a couple different things. All of your temperatures were given in Kelvin, right? Think back to that last year. They're always given in Kelvin. So there are a lot of applications and specifically in chemistry and thermodynamics. In, in this case, low temperature physics, we were just talking about a minute ago, because obviously we're getting closer and closer to absolute zero. Let's look at one example to end today. It's a relatively easy example. Your homework tonight, you have a couple of them. One of them is one of those questions where it says, like, if you have 20 degrees change in Fahrenheit, how much is that in Celsius? You could just pick temperatures of zero and 20 and find both and just look at the change. Or you can use that idea earlier of the nine-fifths where we looked at those scales. Okay, so if nine-fifths helps, you can use that also. So this is the lowest outdoor temperature ever recorded on Earth. Okay, this was in Antarctica in 1983. So this is not even close to absolute zero. Absolute zero would be negative 273.15. So we're, we're really far from there still. And, that, and that's in Celsius, I'm sorry, in Celsius. We'll see what this is in, in Celsius in a minute. So this is our temperature in Fahrenheit, negative 128.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And we're looking for... We'll start with Celsius first. Why would it make sense to start with Celsius first? Yeah, we have the easy conversion there. The only one that we could convert to right away could be Rankin if we wanted to. <coughs> we have another formula with TR, it relates TR and TF. Okay, so either of those could be a starting point, but you don't want to go to Kelvin right away because there's no direct conversion to Kelvin. But either of these formulas we could start with. Now, is the formula solved for TR on the previous slide? I forget. Did we solve it for TR? Back to the previous slide. What does it say? TC plus 
number TF plus 460. Okay, so we can do that one here. This is TF. And then 460, that's the difference there. And I'm not going to put degrees here, actually. Rankin and Kelvin don't actually use degrees, which is kind of weird. I don't know why they did this. I'm trying to think back. I feel like I learned this at some point in time. Like you would say 25 degrees Celsius, you would say 25 Kelvins. You wouldn't say degrees Kelvin. I forget why it is. But for some reason, the absolute scales, or it might just be the Kelvin scale. I know for a fact on the Kelvin scale, you don't say the word degrees. I have no, I have no idea why. When you give a label, you just put a K. You don't put degrees K. Yeah. Rankin, I think. Rankin, I think. They're both approximate because there's decimals. Like 273.15 is the number, but we use 273 for the, for the Kelvin difference. So it's fine either way. Okay, and then the Celsius formula. What do we have for the Celsius formula? Go ahead, Will. Nine-fifths TC over nine. Sorry. Five over nine uh, times TF minus 32. And this is in parentheses, right? Yeah. Okay, the grouping matters there, yeah. So I, I looked it up. And yeah. It says that, I guess just like how when you use radians, you don't say degrees. They say because Fahrenheit and Celsius are between two arbitrarily chosen points, while Kelvin is uh, an actual group. That makes sense. It's an actual unit itself. So degrees are implying increments. Yeah. So this is this many degrees between. That makes sense. So think about Kelvin starting at zero. Kelvin is the unit. Rankin is the unit itself. Celsius is between zero to 100, really, the idea of those freezing and, and boiling. And you think about how many increments are there. There's 100 of them there. So there are 100 different degrees or levels. Interesting, that makes sense. Um, so plugging in, what do we get for TC? What do we get for TR? And then afterward we can get TK at the end from TC. What does TC become? Guys, these are simple mathematical things, right? But just have a calculator out, right? That's the last question, we got two minutes, we can just wait. What do you got, Will? In the plaza. You got it? What is it? Negative 89.2. And Rankin? What did we get for Rankin? So if we want Kelvin, we'll use our last formula, which is TC plus 273. So we're looking at 100 and some odd, what? 183, Yeah. So still 180 Kelvin away from absolute zero, even though that's the coldest temperature. And please, somebody make sure to do your work. Or I think it's two days, right, for you guys? I'm going to see you tomorrow. Yeah. So you have two days. Yeah.